Well, hello everyone. Welcome back to our latest episode on our Heroes series. Um, we could be heroes. And uh, this is <laughs> from the laugh. Some of you might recognize who our special guest is today. <laughs> He's back again. But this series, we are taking some time uh, to chat with some of the folks, some of the members here of All Nations Church, and just asking them, who are your heroes of faith? Uh, they're not biblical heroes, but um, people that have gone before that have lived a life of faith in God and done amazing things and, and finding out how that is inspiring them to to live out for, for God where they are. And so today I'm joined once again by uh, my host and friend, Keir Adams. Hello, hello. And we're both very excited to welcome back a regular on the podcast now, <laughs> Roger Aubrey. Hello, Hi, hello. Roger. <laughs> Great to be back. It's good to be back. We're all looking very relaxed. We've, we've done this before. <laughs> and we have coffee. And we have coffee. <laughs> Roger, we're really, really grateful for you coming back today. A pleasure. Um, and we're really, really looking forward to, to hearing about uh, what for you is a really um, a, a personal hero. Yeah, yeah, very much so, yes. Um, and, and we're, we're going to get into that. So perhaps you could just kick us off, just introduce us to... Uh, your hero, what's his name, uh, where is he from, what's he known for? Okay, well, my particular hero, uh, one of a few heroes of mine, is a man called Jim Elliott, mm. who um, was uh, basically known posthumously, more, more well-known posthumously, uh, because he was one of five American missionaries who were martyred in the Ecuadorian jungle in 1956. Mm. Uh, I think it's honouring to mention the other men, uh, Ed McCulley, Pete Fleming, Roger Udarian, and Nate Saint, who was a pilot with the Missionary Aviation Fellowship. And these five men were part of um, a missionary enterprise that they called Operation Auka, which was part of an ongoing process to reach the Huarani people, Mm. in the Ecuadorian jungle. Um, they were known as a particularly savage people. Um, the, the word auka is a term used by the surrounding tribal groups to describe them, which means savage. Right. Uh, and they were known for their, their vicious uh, killing ways, even among themselves, mm. um, with the other tribes around them. And even with Western people going back to the conquistadors, mm. um, every t encounter with them ended in death. Wow. Um, and uh, including in the 50s, the oil companies who were work beginning to work into the Amazon mm. forest area, their workers, if they left the compounds, they would be killed. And many refused to work there mm. because the Huarani or the Auka, I guess we'll call them now, were um, particularly, particularly vicious. Wow. And uh, Jim Elliott and the other five, or the other four men, uh, were part of a, an operation to reach them with the gospel. And that was their decision, wasn't it? It they, was they their knew decision. The reputation, but that was yes, their it was an ongoing thing. And Jim Elliott first began in about 1952 to feel a call, a burden to go to them, and with the other men uh, who were involved in other things. But they came together at the, towards the end of 1955 to move into the region. They learned the language. And a couple of the men had learned uh, phrases of the Auka dialect through a, a lady called Dayuma, who was one of the tribe who'd left for fleeing for her life. I was living wow. on a mission station. Hmm. And so um, they spent some months trying to establish contact, with dropping gifts. Mm. Um, out of the airplane. Out of the airplane, yeah. as Nate Saint would circle drop gifts. Then they succeeded in having personal contact with a man called George who came out from the jungle, took him up in the plane. And uh, they tell he almost tried to get out because he had no sense of height. <laughs> um, and they were thought they were having some success. Um, and then in January, January the 8th, 1956, um, they, they were encountered by 10 members of the tribe who were actually had come to kill them hmm. and, and the, the story we found out later it's all to do with a domestic but one of the girls who wanted to leave the tribe and her one of her suitors was jealous and thought she was leaving and the foreigner were taking her and um, so they decided to kill 
Hmm. So they came out of the jungle. And uh, even though the men had guns, the five had guns, they had vowed that they would not kill any person who didn't know Christ. Wow. And so when they came, they had these big nine-foot-long spears, and they stabbed them and killed them, killed the five of them. Wow. Mm. And that's, that's what happened to them. So they all died. Yeah. And Jim was only 28. Wow. They were all young men. Yeah. And how do we how do we have Jim's story? Well, we have Jim's story through two books that were written by his widow Elizabeth Elliot. Mm. The first was called Through Gates of Splendor, which uh, told a story up, up until what was known, uh, including the the path to uh, the river where they camped and the incident, and what happened afterwards, mm. um, as much as was known from outside. Yeah. And then the other book uh, was her biography of Jim. It's called Shadow of the Almighty. Uh, when, of course, my growing up in the late 50s, because I was only three when it happened, and 60s, they became kind of seminal books right. um, to read. And that's how it began to affect me. So it was only later that uh, Elizabeth Elliot and Rachel Saint who was Nate Saint's sister, and his son Steve, who when he was growing up, and others, continued to work towards the Alka. They didn't give up. And a couple of years later, by a, co by a couple of years later, Elizabeth and Rachel were actually accepted into the village. And, wow. And, uh, of course, the villagers were affected by their love, mm. and many came to Christ, That's including the killers, several of the killers. Wow, wow. And it was years later when they, because when Steve Saint went in as a young man, they half expected him, as part of their culture, that he would come with revenge to kill. Yeah. And he didn't. And it was that kind of love mm. and acceptance and their confusion because the, the five men didn't shoot. They just said, why have you, we come in peace. Mm. Why have you come to kill us? And they allowed them to kill them. And they couldn't, that did not compute at all. And then the love that was shown to them led to them being saved. And then over time, they shared what had, their, why they'd come and why they'd done it mm -hmm. and what had happened. So in later, so people like Steve Saint and articles and books were written and a film was made eventually um, to, from both sides. So you have what happened from the missionary side and then years later you have what happened, why the Alka did it and the mm. result. Wow. Of, uh, so, yeah, they became believers. Interestingly as well, as well as the men not fighting back, uh, several of them witnessed, which has been documented, these strange creatures flying in the sky hmm. above them. And it was only after they became believers in Jesus and read the scriptures they realized they were angels. Wow. They knew something at some because they were, I think, they were anim. I'm not sure if they were animists, but they believed in the supernatural. Of course, yeah. they realized something had happened. Yeah, yeah. And that's uh, that's the the story in a nutshell. I I think we'll we'll unpick some of those things yeah. and ask you um, perhaps why Jim's story and 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 all the gentlemen um, and Elizabeth the strength yeah. to forgive and to <laughs> yes. go back in. I I think we can talk a little bit about that, but. Let's just step back a minute and Roger, can yes. you just tell us, how did you come across this story? <laughs> how, how has it come to mean something so dear mm. to you? Uh, it's interesting because <laughs> I couldn't say, because I was only three, three and a few months when it happened. Mm. But growing up, I was born in 52, this happened in 56. Uh, and, uh, but growing up as a child and then growing into the 60s, um, the, the books became um, classics. Mm. Uh, for for Christians to read, uh, and you, and as one read them, you kind of thought, "Wow!" In my lifetime, these young men were willing to lay down their life to pay the ultimate sacrifice. Yeah. For their service to Jesus. Now that was, uh, I suppose, it was more subliminal than everything. Because it wasn't thinking, "Well, I'm going to go out and do the same." But I think growing up in a missionary family as well, my, my uncle and aunt were missionaries in Eritrea. Right. Um, 
so this idea that uh, I think, yeah, I think Dave, we we were encouraged to live, give our life to Jesus for a cause. Mm. Yeah, we weren't strong on the nature of the church. Evangelicals weren't, but we we believed that Jesus had our life. Yeah, and that we would give ourselves for a cause, uh, whatever it was. Mm. And for me personally, reading their story, it was one this and the the cross and the switchblade uh, were the two books that uh, God used to really say, "Are you serious about what you've done, giving mm. me your life?" I was thirteen in '66 when I gave my life to Jesus, but before then, I had this sense my life belonged to Him, and I had no idea what that meant. But if, this was um, this was serious. Yeah. Um, although, you know, I was, I wasn't the sober side in any way, but back of your head thinking, I suppose subconsciously it affected me Hmm. that here's a story. I mean, I love Treasure Island and all that, those (laughs) stories, but this is a true story Mm -hmm. that ended not in failure, even though they died, because by then the the ongoing story was leading to the salvation of the people, yeah. the transformation of these, these these folks who had been killers. Yeah. So I, I guess it was um, because I they were posthumous heroes. Yeah. They were dead. Yeah. But mm-hmm. their story lived. Yeah. And it was true, and it happened in my lifetime. And they hadn't gone out to make a splash no. for themselves. Yeah. It was, this is the back end of nowhere. This is the middle of the right. e- Ecuadorian yeah. rainforest. That's right. Um, and and they'd chosen the most, one of the most dangerous yes. people groups to go and reach. They were very dangerous. Yeah. They knew, they knew they were putting their lives in their hands because yeah. history, like right, several hundred years, it had always ended in death. Mm. And it was interesting because it was world news, apparently. Right that these five men had been killed or, and then they had to send Marines in to, to f- discover them. They were all on, in the river and uh, they buried them. But then Life magazine, if you remember, the old magazine, Life, Kia might remember that because it's a great <laughs> photography magazine. Yeah. Life magazine <laughs> ran a feature on it. Yeah. And that's when it became world news. And from then, when the book came, it, it kind of was embedded in the Christian consciousness mm. um, as part of the great tradition of people, um, you know, that uh, like Amy Carmichael, Gladys Aylward, uh, p- people like that, um, C.T. Studd. It, they were in that tradition, mm. that line of men mm. and women who were known, I will go. Yeah. And we were always encouraged, will you go mm. anywhere? Yeah. And I guess... Uh, even in that, you know, it's happening, like as you said, it's happening in your lifetime, but you're also in your lifetime seeing uh, what the outworking of what God is doing in that. So it's not just an inspiring story of, of you know, a few men's faithfulness and their their courage, but you're also then seeing the, the outworking of God's ongoing story after that. And, and I, I wonder if even that was something inspiring for you that you say, wow, if I do say yes to God, then mm. I can see that God will take it and do something with it. Yeah, I suppose that's an interesting interesting question. Cause at the time, I probably wasn't aware of that. Right. It was the fact that they were willing yeah. to go to that ex- that extent. Yeah. Not that I had a death wish yeah. at all. You know, I was young boy, I was a teenager. I think I want to live a long time. <laughs> um, but I, I guess as the years went by, and the story continued, and then combined with that, and then other stories came out of people like David Wilkerson, mm. um, Corrie Ten Boom, yeah, uh, <laughs> and others. Uh, that you and uh, we were talking before we came on. There was a young lady who was not famous at all today. His name was her name was Sally Trench, and she wrote a book called "Bury Me with My Boots On." Yeah, and of course, then you have. Um, the um, the lady uh, chasing the dragon, um, yeah, Jackie, Jackie, Pullinger. Jackie Pullinger, which is slightly later. So yeah, I guess it was this was so embedded in my consciousness, and then seeing wow, this happened afterwards, mm. and then seeing other things of people who came from nothing and who 
who lived in, and saw these ongoing things and thought, wow, this really is an incredible adventure I've gotten into. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I didn't know what part I was about to play. I, I didn't feel any call to mission field or nothing yeah. like that. But it was just in my life, yeah, I'm all in. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, and you asked that you asked this question again before we came on, Kia. Um, do you think there was something that was going on that was that either was needed or God was doing in your generation mm. where you had these different heroes coming through that were contemporary to you, that where God was doing something and, and laying out a fresh call to a generation yeah. to say, will you give me your everything? I, I think that was an interesting question. When you asked it before we came on, I thought, and still trying to reflect that, but I, I imagine so because... You know, I'm a I'm a baby boom. I was born seven years after the end of the Second World War, mm. and there'd been a generation before. Like my father was in his twenties when he went off to war. Yeah, mm. yeah. Um, so there was that generation, and not that you know we were looking for our adventure of war, not at all. But they had answered a, a massive call. Mm. Yeah, mm. and I think for us, growing up in the fifties and the sixties, and of course then. I think God's preparing us for what happened in the 60s. Yeah. Because the 60s changed everything. Although the 60s probably didn't start till about 65, 66. (laughs) But looking back, you found in the 60s that everybody lived for for a cause. Right. Whether it was the student movements in Paris, whether it was the Jesus people, Mm -hmm. or whether it was the Prague Spring of 68, you know, the, the attempts to overthrow the Soviet Union. You found the anti-Vietnam demonstrations mm. resulting in the, the killings at uh, Kent State University. Mm. You found the burning of the draft cards. You found all these movements. You had the civil rights movement with mm. Dr. King. Mm. So everybody was living for something. Yeah. You had this sense of a, a purpose beyond your life. Yeah. And I, I guess in re- retrospect, I think God was saying, yes, you live for me. Yeah. And so for us, uh, we were prepared to do anything for Jesus. And we did. Well, you know, we didn't go out on to Ecuador, but we were prepared and we were just, we'd do anything. Yeah. Yeah. And I suppose looking back, it was, that had an effect on me. I wasn't thinking, well, Jim Elliot did, I must. It was, God had used this incident and this yeah. thing. This, this, event to just in, in, inscribe something in my heart and talking with folks of my generation interesting they say oh that that person affected me that affected me mm-hmm. that affected me i know others they say it was gladys aylwood her story the missionary to china mm-hmm. others will say it was jackie pullinger others will say it was this yeah but there seemed to be at that time certain people that god used mm-hmm. to inspire another generation yeah i'm wondering if i don't know if that's there today yeah i mean you were saying beforehand before we came on there i'm not sure about that yeah i don't know yeah. and that's not to demean this generation but i do believe every generation has to have a cause to live for yeah mm. yeah <laughs> uh, i think i think roger that's a, a really big question um well, but for our listeners to ask themselves as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, who And part of this podcast is, who are your heroes? That's the question that yes. we're asking yeah. uh, ourselves and just asking people in the church. Um, one thing here you, you mentioned just off now, which is that in many ways we have an influx of influencers, heroes. There's a whole culture that comes with that. But I think what's what's different to to our moment and to what you're saying mm. is that these guys didn't set out to be heroes. Yeah. No, we didn't have this uh, sense of, of the Christian personality. Right. The yeah. celebrity Christian. They weren't perfect, of course. Mm. They were men and women. They were ordinary men and women. They had their failings. They were people. But you didn't see, which tragically happens today, the, the rise and f- very public fall, which... I think it, it can, as Kia was saying when we were just off mic, uh, it can destroy confidence mm. in putting one's trust or getting one's values from anybody. 
Yeah. Because they fall. That wasn't, that didn't happen then. Mm. But more particularly, uh, people like Elliot and the, the other four men uh, and the other folks that we've cited, they didn't call themselves heroes. Yeah. They didn't see it as heroic. They didn't see it as noble. They mm. didn't see it as something by which they would get a book deal. Mm. Yeah. Um, wow. And anything like that. Yeah. That did not exist then. It was uh, the idea of self sacrifice. Yeah. Of, um, it's that classic quote. Uh, that uh, Eliot, and maybe you can tell us when he when he gave it, because yeah. it's surprising how young he was. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Yeah. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. That marked my life. And many people today will use that quote not knowing where it comes from. Mm. Yeah. But of course, Dave, you can tell us where it comes from exactly. Well, yeah, in prepping for the podcast, I knew Jim's story, but started... Yeah. Uh, reading through Shadow of the Almighty, and I think that's one of the first. It's one of the on one of the first pages. Very early on, yes. and his wife Elizabeth, who who wrote who wrote those two books, um, uh, she says he wrote that in high school. She has his old diaries. Yes, he was wow. in high school, so he's fifteen, sixteen, yes. and and Jesus has just captured him. Mm, and yeah. so perhaps actually we we could dive in a little bit more, Roger, perhaps into Jim Elliot's life. So he's and and perhaps you could tell us. Um, some of the characteristics, perhaps some of the moments in his life, some of the things that he's written that have particularly inspired you. Um, I, I think what inspired me, Dave, because obviously he was he was came from a Christian environment, Christian mm. family, as, yeah. as I did. And by the way, I'm not comparing myself to Jim Elliot in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> but I think we're quite typical of people growing up in Christian environments and families in the 50s and 60s. So he came, born in Portland, Oregon, mm. 1927, but raised in a Christian family, parents Christians. And when he comes to Christ, from that moment on, he's totally dedicated, to, with a total single eye. Yeah. And uh, and even in the book, and as you find, uh, he could be very intolerant. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. As any, any any teenager could be. <laughs> yeah. But particularly so, I think, um, and uh, Keith Green, who who I particularly love, and Keith Green. Um, who, who was a musician who died in a plane crash was quite similar mm. uh, and yet incredibly uh, personable, funny. But they had this single eye and I think he could be intolerant. Um, he would quite easily pass judgment on those who didn't agree with him, mm. um, uh, be judgmental on people. Uh, but the, I think that's that's a that's a characteristic that probably carried him through mm. that the Lord worked on and honed and chipped away at him. Yeah. Because even to choosing his wife, you know, he was very focused and saying, well, whoever's going to be my wife is going to have to be able to come with me to do this. Yeah. And he was very, fa- his, one of his other famous quotes was, Lord, I don't ask you for a long life. I ask you for a full one. Yeah. Yeah. And you think, well, any man who says that and his wife is coming along and think, well, and she had this idea, he, well, he wasn't going to see old bones. Mm. Mm. And so he, when he went to Wheaton College, he was a graduate of Wheaton. He was known there as a, a writer, but a radical, and a man who would not take prisoners. Yeah. He was a, just focused. And I think people like that can turn people off because they are almost intransigent. They don't listen. And they can become arrogant and legalistic. Mm. And I think that tendency could be in him, as it can be in anybody. I think yeah. I was like that. Right. I think I've been like that. But um, the Holy Spirit can take something hmm. and work in it. Yeah. So by the time he's standing on a beach with a man running at him, he says, um, you know, kill me. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> I, yeah. Think, I think that's, that's interesting where we've ended up. Um, thinking about the context of what we're talking about our generation and, and seeing mm. people that are held up and, and venerated fall because of failings. Um, we're not going to get necessarily into the morals and how we deal no. with that. But when we look at our own individual lives, you can look at it and go, God can use even my weaknesses yeah. and my failings. Yes. And and he, if I, if I am willing as, as Jim Elliott was, if I'm willing to lay, lay all before him, yeah, he can use absolutely Absolutely anything for his glory. Yes, I think um, 
God doesn't wait until we're totally perfected. Yeah, right. No. Uh, and you look at, uh, uh, it's, I've just finished reading the biography of A.W. Tozer, and you mm. find uh, he's a fantastic preacher, but a very difficult man. Yeah. <laughs> By his own admission. He much preferred to being on his own in his study with God than being with his family. Hmm. Um, you think, well, that's not how we wouldn't teach that. Uh, and yet we all love Tozer. Yeah. But if you look at any person in history, uh, we're, we're, we're the same. We're, we're works in progress. Yeah. 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 But God seemed to be able to take hold of him with this steely determination, knowing where his destiny would take him. Mm. Because I think if, if he were a man who would you know, bow with the wind and give in to everything, he never would have achieved it. Yeah. And I think it's sometimes better to take and say, boy, look at this young man, this young woman. They're strong-headed, they're stubborn, they're intolerant, they don't give an inch, if I think. But I, I look at Jesus and the disciples and I think, <clears throat> yeah, well, if you look at the people he chose. <laughs> yeah. He chose. Yeah. And I look at myself. I could be incredibly stubborn, yeah, uh, rebellious, and um, I didn't want anybody telling me what to do. Mm. And, and yet the Lord says, I'll, I'll take hold of you. Yeah. But it was reading people like Eliot and, mm -hmm. and Macaulay and Fleming and Eudarian and Saint. They were men. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not being anti-feminine, but they were men. Yeah. They weren't wimps. Yeah. Um, Jackie Pullinger. You know, we're fearless yeah. going in right yeah. into the drug dens. Yeah. Uh, Gladys Aylward, a tiny little cleaning woman from London who got rejected by the China Inland Mission, goes all on a train all the way across China, Russia and China, to be a missionary in China, thinking, you've got to have something about you mm. yeah. that says, I don't care what you say, I'm going to do it. Yeah. Yeah. And I prefer to have people like that than who are just so compliant. Yeah. Yeah, 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 and I think just a slight aside on that, but I think there's a really great lesson for us in that, which is uh, for us to not give up on people. Absolutely, um, just because they're a bit rough around the edges, and mm. it can be so easy for us to write them off when actually just bearing with somebody. You you never know what God is doing, and as you said, Dave, you never know what God is going to take of their life and and refine it and turn mm. it to pure gold. Uh, because you could look at the life of a Jim Elliot and say, oh, well, before he's used by God, he's got to be way less stubborn. He's got to be you know, yes. way less judgmental. And you're like, well, yes, you could say that, but God's going to do it in his way. Uh, yes. and, and then for us, we just say, Holy Spirit, give us eyes to see what you are doing in this person's life. Because yes. then I have a part to play in helping that person realize their full potential in God, yeah. which is exciting then for us. Yes. So you never know. If you're in the presence of the next Jim Elliot, when you read Elliot's story all the way through, he's he's got this incredibly stubborn focus, mm -hmm. and he's known in, in Wheaton, you know, for it, yeah. incredibly radical. But he, but he wouldn't take telling. He, he wasn't a troublemaker. No, mm. a very righteous man. But even with uh, Operation Alka, he was very driven. Yeah, this was going to happen. Mm. And even though he was told, you know, this is you're taking your life in your hands, and but he said, I, I don't care, I'm going in, and yeah. it was almost like you're not, you're not listening to reason. Now he wasn't gung ho uh, and stupid, but he he just wouldn't take telling. Yeah, he said, well, the the Alka, they kill everybody. He said, I know, and that's why I'm going in. Yeah, yeah. and he just said, for goodness sake, Jim, you're just married, mm. your wife's having a baby. I know. Mm. And it's not he said, well, I, I don't care. But he just had this stubbornness. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you're so right, Kia. And I, I'm very grateful in my life that there have been men and women who haven't given up on me. Yeah. yeah. They've taken hold of me. And they said, not maybe not knowing what I would become, because I had no clue in that sense. But uh, they said, well, there's something about this boy. I'll, I'll, I'll take hold of him. Yeah. I'll believe in him. Yeah. yeah. And it's, uh, I think it's much easier to, to guide that and hone that and chip the block, chip off the block. Yeah. Than trying to motivate someone to get out of bed in the morning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Would you, would, you, would you consider praying today? Yeah. <laughs> you know, with Jim Elliott and people that we've mentioned, they were never told, you know, you've got to pray, you've got to read the Bible, mm -hmm. you've got to share. They didn't take telling. 
they knew that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was going to turn this conversation towards Prex. We're talking about Jim's almost the way he comes across to other people. But actually, what you find when you read The Shadow of the Almighty yeah. is the depth of his prayer life. Yes. I mean, he would yeah. write his prayers down, he would write what he was praying to Elizabeth, to his brother, to his yes. father, to his mother. He, he, he has the journals, doesn't he? It's he worth reading these, his journals. Yeah. You can get those now. Um, and, and, you know, you were talking about he didn't need to be told to pray. There's a, there's a season when uh, he, they're in the jungle and the, the mission station that they're building is washed away or one of the houses yes. they're building is washed away. And he mourns that he doesn't have the time that he had in yes. college to pray because he's, they're just trying to <laughs> survive the rainstorms. Mm, yes. And, and, and I think it's important for us to understand that God's work can take time. He didn't go from being 16 to jumping oh, no. into the jungle. There no, was didn't. a yeah. deep work of prayer yes. um, and and of dedication to God. He wasn't being difficult. He was, with all of his heart, absolutely dedicate, dedicated to his Heavenly Father. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. He often talked about a single eye mm. and a focus. He often talked in his prayer and his writings about having a single eye. Yeah, It meant a lot to him. And his, I think his prayer life kept him focused because when you... I think it was 1952 when he began to turn his attention towards the Alka. Yeah. So it it was six years, or four years yeah. uh, later he died. But it was a four-year program for mm. him. That he, wow. This, my life, I, I just didn't jump on a plane and land on the on the sandbar. Um, and he had to, with McCulley and Fleming in particular, um, working with them, they learned the dialect. Yeah. That they, they were all. You know, this is a long-term project. Yeah. This could be the rest of our life. Yeah, right. it wasn't. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah. We're going to go and preach the gospel and find something else to do. Yeah, we're yeah. prepared that these people are precious to, to Jesus. Wow. Yeah. And then the you know when they lost, you know the camps that flown that were taken away in the storms. No, we're here. Yeah. But the prayer, Lord, you've called us. We're yeah. staying. He gets asked. He gets asked at some point. He writes in his diary. He he's asked why. Why did you go to the Alka? He had an opportunity. He was debating whether to go to India, wasn't yes, he? Yes. And, you it know, was. The, uh, millions of people in India, you know, now, is it the most populous nation as of now on India? I think on it is now, yes. Um, why didn't you go there? Why did you go here where there's a couple of hundred people? This is what we're talking about. It's yes, because they're only a small people. Yeah. people group. Yeah. yeah. But, but it was this, no, God's called me and I've dedicated yeah. to my life. And I think there's, for me reading through it, and I, I'm, I don't know if this is for you, Roger. For me, that was the real one of the real takeaways yes. was in my own life with the Lord. Um, I can I can live like that. Yes, and it, it yeah. wasn't the fame. It wasn't thinking, well, I'm going to be, you know, like a, a William Carey, a missionary to India. He wasn't thinking, I'm going to be famous mm. and leave my mark on a nation. It didn't seem to enter his mind. He yeah. just said, Lord, you are, I am yours. Mm. Where do you want me to serve you? Mm. And wow. the Lord says... The Huarani, the the killer pe the, these killers in the Ecuadorian rainforest. Um, and he says, "Okay," but he goes. Yeah. But I think only a man or woman who is who knows God. Yeah. Yeah. Can yeah. do that. Mm. Um, and that was yeah. the challenge for me, I guess, guys. Growing up was th these people had. Um, it wasn't just the fact that they were adventurous. Mm. The way they talked, the way they wrote. Mm. Um, I mean, my mother heard Gladys Aylward speak not long before she wow. died, mm. the little lady from China. And she's the most remarkable lady. But when you heard her talk, Corrie Ten Boom, of course, famous, mm. she, her, her prayer life, her devotional life. Yeah. They just had this quality of intimacy mm. that they knew God. Yeah. Yeah. And I suppose for me, that was the. The big thing, these people know him. Yeah. Yeah. And I want to know him. Yeah. And yeah. I, I guess for me, combining that with what Paul said in Philippians, where he'd known Jesus, what, 25 years by the time he wrote that. But he says, I want to know him. Mm. Mm. And you think, but I thought you did. <laughs> yeah. But I thought, I don't understand this. But these these men and Jim and the other men... Um, were proven. They were all young men, but they they knew him. Mm. That's what the motivation was. And yeah. their prayer life was this. Yeah. We know him in the secret place. Yeah. Could you summarize then, Roger? We are kind of coming towards the end. 
Could you summarise for yourself and perhaps reflect on um, wider, wider than yourself? Um, what's the legacy that that these heroes, these brave men, have left, and women, the the, uh, the whole families, you know, families impacted yes. by this? Well, I think, yeah. I think the obviously the immediate legacy on the Huwarani, the Alka, has resulted in a transformation of the people. I mean, it's it's many years ago now, and it's ongoing. Mm. Um, there are some um, anthropologists who would question the whole thing because it's better to leave them in their state. But they were killers, and they killed each other. Mm. Um, uh, so it's not just the fact that they've come to know Jesus. But they are, they are now, they have hospitals and things like that, so they're cared for, the place is safer. And it's, it's ongoing, you know, that the, 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 I think they're all dead now, the men who killed. But some grow to old age, which was uh, unusual for them mm. because they would mm. be killed off. So I think the immediate impact on, on the region, on people's lives, people were safe and ongoing. So the legacy continued through family mm. and that. I think, personally for me, for legacy, it's, it's left a legacy in me of um, I'm really serious about my faith. Mm. And then, and I would hate to presume upon this, whatever effect I have had upon people in my life, mm. to a certain extent, is because of the effect of this story on my life. Yeah. So it's... It's that six yeah. degrees of separation, isn't it? So people say, what made you what you are that I want to be like you, Roger? And, and uh, people very graciously sometimes say that. I think, well, I am what I am because of these men and women. Mm. Not in totality, but th that's the legacy that's been left on me. Yeah. Um, which if anybody sees that quality in me, which I pray they will, it's because of them. Um, mm. can, I, can I, I'll read you a quote. May yeah. I read you a mm. quote? That would be good. This comes from um, Through Gates of Splendor, and it's, it's, the very, it's just the very last paragraph, really, um, which Elizabeth Elliot <coughs> is returning to <coughs> the story. And I, I recommend anybody read this book. It's a great book. And... Uh, I actually keep this in my Bible. I have this typed out in my Bible, mm. and it, it, I, I do find it very moving, so excuse me if I, I'll try and hold it together. <laughs> but for me, this, um, this is the legacy it's left in me. Yeah. And it's better to put in his words. But this is what she says. She says, For the wives and the relatives of the five men, the mute longing of their hearts was echoed by words found in Jim Elliot's diary. Uh, and this is the entry. Jim wrote this. I walked out to the hill just now. It is exalting, delicious, to stand embraced by the shadows of a friendly tree, with the wind tugging at your coattail, and the heavens hailing your heart, to gaze and glory and give oneself again to God. What more could a man ask? Oh, the fullness, pleasure, sheer excitement of knowing God on earth. I care not if I never raise my voice again for him, if only I may love him, please him. Mayhap in mercy he shall give me a host of children that I may lead them through the vast star fields to explore his delicacies whose finger ends set them to burning. But if not, if only I may see him, Touch his garments and smile into his eyes. Ah, then, not stars, nor children shall matter, only himself. O Jesus, master and centre and end of all, how long before that glory is thine which has so long waited thee? Now there is no thought of thee among men. Then there shall be thought for nothing else. Now other men are praised. Then none shall care for any other's merits. Hasten, hasten, glory of heaven. Take thy crown. 
subdue thy kingdom, enthrall thy creatures. Wonderful. That's it. Wow. And what an incredible legacy. Yeah. Yes, it is. And that's that's what he's left me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, Roger, we're so grateful. It's been a pleasure yeah. and an honour. Thank you. And uh, it's a bit of a tongue-in-cheek title to call the, the season We Could Be Heroes, but I think there's something really precious in that, that uh, a man over, what was coming up 70 years ago, yes. laid down his life for the Lord with his with his friends, and it's it's inspired you, mm. and it's mm. inspired a generation, and now... You you're sat here in the All Nations Centre, yes, and you've given your life into this place and into many places around the world, to many people around the world, and you mm. can look around and say, "I carried on the legacy of the heroes." Yes, I am here me. in part because of him and yeah. the four men: Udarian, Fleming, McCully, and Saint, mm. and Elizabeth Elliot, and Rachel Saint, and Steve, and all their families. I'm here in part because of them. Mm. Yeah, and I'm moving. I'm very, I'm very moved, but I, I'm eternally grateful for them. Mm. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Thank you, Roger. Yeah, You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kia. Trust your listeners have enjoyed yeah. this episode. Um, trust that it's got you thinking about your own reasons for following Jesus and considering who you look to, um, and who might be following along in your legacy. We'll leave you with that thought, and we'll see you next time. Thanks. See you then. Bye. Bye. Bye.